We have an exciting panel here. We've got Tommy Sporkin from the SEC, from the OMI group, and Peter Group from the FBI in New York, and Sam Dratty from uh, FINRA's insider trading area. So thanks, guys, for uh, taking the time. These guys are very, very busy, so I thank you on behalf of FINRA for, uh, for coming today and spending some time with us. So, you know, I should say before we start, because we have the, the feds here, if anybody is committing any fraud, if you just raise your hand and sit at that table over there, much appreciated. Um, Peter will talk to you afterwards. Um, Tommy, let me start off. Uh, the Office of Market Intelligence for the SEC uh, has been up for about a year and a half now, right? That's correct. And that's one of the new specialized units uh, Rob Kazami put into place. Can you can you just give the audience a flavor for what what you've seen in the in the first uh, year and a half of that office being up and running? I, I will, Cam. But let me also start with a disclaimer and say that the um, views I express today are my own and not those of the uh, commission or members of the commission. Um, this um, this first slide kind of represents a nice uh, few bullets on the things that we've been seeing in the Office of Market Intelligence. Uh, January of last year, our group was created. Uh, all tips, complaints, and referrals within the agency now come into my group. Um, we vet them, we analyze them, and we assign them out to, uh, to the various investigative groups across the country, whether those be our new specialized groups, uh, home office associate director groups, or our regional offices. Uh, and included in the, in the enforcement side, we also, uh, along with our partners in our Office of Compliance, Inspections, Examinations, refer things to the examinations uh, group as well. Um, this past year, um, we, we uh, have seen a great deal of offering frauds and Ponzi schemes. Uh, they're just as prevalent as ever. Uh, I would have guessed after uh, the, the revelations of Madoff and Stanford that you would see fewer because you, there wouldn't be as much um, uh, uh, investors who would who would believe that you know they could get uh, fantastic returns, but we're still seeing uh, just as many as ever. Um, we've also seen something interesting. I don't know if you've been keeping up with this. The the Chinese uh, or international reverse merger companies that are trading on uh, major exchanges, uh, they start similar to the way that the old you know uh, over the counter reverse merger companies uh, would start and get traded, uh, except. By basing their operations in China, they can create the appearance that they have fabulous uh, assets. And the reason they can do that is because the uh, the the, the, effective, uh, the effectiveness of the accounting um, operations over there uh, are not uh, they're not able to get a lot of the the documents that are needed to conduct a, a full gas uh, 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 audit. So recently, um, a lot of the exchanges have gotten together, I think with um, some of the guys, some of your, your finger people, I think Sam's one of them, um, and they have uh, come into the SEC and we've, we've tried to really create a lot of awareness here. And um, I know that it's, it's now more difficult uh, to, to uh, list on these exchanges. Uh, I also know that the accounting departments in these foreign countries, or the accounting firms in these foreign countries, are now actually going to banks, watching the banks print out the account statements of these companies. So the level of skepticism with regard to the um, uh, the, the audits are, are much greater. Um, the new whistleblower program, we're about to have final rules voted on on Wednesday of this week. Um, those have uh, stirred a lot of controversy. Uh, you'll see. And there's been a lot in the press as to why, you know, should the, the big issue is should internal reporting be encouraged, mandated, uh, incentivized in some way, and um, the, the proposed rules and the new rules do address that. And, and there have been a lot of people lining up on both sides of the aisle, the whistleblower aisle uh, side and the corporate uh, community, uh, and, and it's a very polarizing issue. Um, but we have a whistleblower office, and we're going to have whistleblower rules uh, come Wednesday if, if the vote goes according to, uh, if it gets voted on uh, positively. We also have a new microcap working group. The head of that, there, there are two uh, co-national heads, one of which is, serves double duty as the um, microcap coordinator within the Office of Market Intelligence. 
Um, and the other person is an assistant director in our New York office on the exam side. So we have both enforcement representation and exam representation, the idea being that we can collect, uh, collect intelligence from both sides, uh, kind of bring that in together, analyze it in, 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 together, and prioritize better the microcap uh, matters that come before us, then disperse those out um, in prioritized uh, and hope that um, the best ones get, get traction. Um, one of the things that um, we've seen, uh, particularly over the last year, is the, the cooperation uh, between the SEC and the FBI, and I was wondering if you could comment on, on that, uh, both Tommy and Peter. Yeah, um, it was a great idea that started a couple of years ago and didn't take hold until uh, the middle of last year. But the idea was to embed an FBI agent um, who has, um, who, who's connected with the uh, Economic Crimes Unit and the Financial Intelligence Center on the FBI side and bring them into the Office of Market Intelligence on our side. So they would have access to the raw intelligence, the FBI's raw intelligence and the SEC's raw intelligence intelligence, with the idea being to connect more dots. Um, it's been very successful. We have a lot of great cooperation, uh, a lot of great uh, joint uh, sharing of data and joint operations. Um, I don't know, Peter, did you want to comment on? Yeah, certainly from an FBI standpoint, uh, the, the key is uh, working with the regulatory agencies, but also getting the information as quickly and, and as real time as we can. And much like we have task forces located all over the country, if not the world, for different uh, criminal activity, same theory was, was uh, fostered here between the FBI and the SEC, was to physically have an agent and an analyst embedded with the SEC to be there with them, collecting the information, and more importantly, uh, acting upon it, reviewing our databases to see if there's a need for, for any action. I think it just uh, causes us to be much more efficient as everyone would expect us to be. Now, there is a uh, small little case I know your group was involved in. Um, maybe you guys heard about it. Um, I just put uh, Raj Raja Ratnam's photo up there. But I was wondering, um, it, you know, I know your group had uh, worked uh, closely on that case and had participated uh, in the investigation. I was wondering if you could share with the audience uh, some of the techniques you used and why you used those techniques in this particular case. You know, in, in general, certainly with respect to white collar crime, as the crimes become more sophisticated, we need as a law enforcement agency to be uh, in line with the increase in technology and the like. So we're constantly trying to improve our techniques uh, trying to find new ways to, to, to do better. And we employed many, many different tactics in the, the Raja Ratnam investigation. That investigation still continues, as there's been, I think, approximately 37 people charged. Uh, Mr. Raja Ratnam was just one of those, and he was tried by himself. There were the others that had pled guilty and testified against him. It's a long-term investigation. It's been... Uh, I initiated that case well over three years ago. Uh, it's gone in many different directions into many different business sectors. Uh, but one of the, the techniques that was, was certainly publicized when we began charging people was the use of wiretaps. Uh, we used many of the uh, traditional techniques, as you would expect, through financial analysis, physical surveillance, uh, things like that. This was... Uh, somewhat new and innovative because of the wiretap feature that was used from an investigative technique standpoint. It really had not been used before in uh, insider trading investigations. And I can tell you by sitting through most of the seven weeks of trial, uh, I'm, I'm glad we did. Uh, nowadays, people, I don't know if it's the CSI generation where they're expecting audio and video for every crime that's committed, but it really was important, in spite of the fact that you had witnesses testifying that they participated in crimes, you had photographs, you had whatever, you think you have a very strong investigation, but after seven weeks of trial, I'm darn glad that we used the wiretaps, and you could hear the defendant in his own words uh, committing crimes. 
And I think the jurors, when they came back, that was one of the, the most compelling pieces of evidence that we had was the wiretaps. And it's an organized crime technique. It's been used in, in other crimes. But with respect to the concern about insider trading in the hedge fund industry, this was the first time it had been used, and, and it was a uh, tremendous return on our investment. Three years of wiretaps on many, many different cell phones, uh, all hours of the day and night, and it, uh, it really did pay dividends at the end. Did you, is there anything you learned from that investigation that surprised you? I mean, there's a thousand different stories uh, during the course of that investigation. Uh, I, I wouldn't know where to start, really, from, from uh, uh, you know, we were challenged. We used wiretaps, uh, and yet we were challenged right at the very end as to the necessity of using wiretaps. If you're familiar with uh, the Scrooge opinion, which was a health care case uh, down in Birmingham, Alabama, years ago, we were accused for being too close with the regulatory agencies. In this case, we were accused of not being friendly enough with the regulatory agencies. There has to be a necessity to use wiretaps. You have to really uh, have a good reason to tap somebody's telephone. It's a huge invasion of, of one's privacy. Uh, this goes before a judge. It's not something that the FBI could do on its own in the United States Attorney's Office. We have to present the evidence to a judge. Uh, and in spite of, of a judge's ruling and the like, it, did, it was appealed uh, and, and we prevailed, you know, thankfully.